Welcome to our first lecture covering Chapter 6. This uh, chapter is all about legal capacity. This, of course, is the third of the four requirements for contracts. So let's begin. Uh, so what is capacity? Here's a quick definition of it. I don't know if it sheds more light on it, but the benefit of it, I guess, is that it's short. Capacity is the same thing as competency in the law. In everyday conversation in the English language, we use capacity in two different ways, but they're closely related. One way I have here in this little visual, we talk about capacity in terms of how much something will hold. So for example, if we're buying milk, we might say I'm going to get the one gallon milk or the one half gallon milk. Or we're talking about buying a container that holds, you know, a gallon of milk or a gallon of whatever that might have. Or maybe we're going to buy a large uh, soda. So we're going to buy a two liter soda or maybe we're going to buy a 20 ounce soda. We think in terms of how much the item is capable of carrying its size. But capacity has another meaning and we can see that right here when we look at the word. It starts C-A-P-A -A, just like the word capable starts. And if we say something is capable we say it can do it. It has the inherent ability to be successful. So if I say I am capable of running a mile in eight minutes, it means that it doesn't mean I'm going to do it every time. It doesn't mean that I want to necessarily do it, but it means that I have the skills and the physical conditioning necessary to accomplish that goal. And so that's what we mean when we say capable. Of course, we can be capable or we can be incapable. Um, it, obviously, I would be incapable of running a four-minute mile. And so that would be an example. No matter how hard I try at my current level of fitness, um, I would not be able to accomplish a four-minute mile. So we would say I would be incapable. And we put the I in in front. I in, of course, is a prefix that means not capable. So if we say incapacity we're saying I don't have the capacity you know I'm a half gallon milk but I you see I have the I lack the capacity for a full gallon of milk I am incapable of holding that much milk so a related concept and again we're using this as the definitional concept is the idea of competency am I competent to do a particular task. Am I capable? Basically, these are synonyms for each other. Um, you can see in the word competency, the word compete. Am I uh, sufficiently skilled that I'm going to be reasonable competition in that particular activity? Again, I'm not competent to run a four minute mile. If there's a race and everybody else can run a four minute mile, I'm really not competent to compete in that. We would say I'm incompetent to compete in that. So again, competency or ability might be good synonyms for uh, the word of capacity. We look at capacity on an objective level. So we're not, you know, the reality is that lots of us think we're able to do things that frankly we're not able to do. Um, if you were to talk to a young child, a young child might think that he or she has the ability to decide his or her own bedtime, for example, or decide what he or she ought to eat or whether he or she needs to go to school. Um, it's pretty common that people think they have abilities that they just don't have. And so we're not talking about what a person thinks they can be able to do. We're going to apply an objective standard uh, to, to measure that. So it's not just what the person's subjective opinion is, but how the law and the general society would look upon that particular circumstance. We're actually going to break down this category into five subcategories, and during this lecture, we're going to discuss the first two. These are by far the most important, and then we'll finish up with our last three categories. So we're going to talk about who is an adult by law and who is legally sane by law. So let's get started. Here are some images for the whole idea of minors' contractual capacity. Um, we have here just some typical high schoolers and how they might be interacting. Maybe some of them are younger than high schoolers. Um, this might be our example of people who are 
you know, pretty together. They're smart. They can read. They can write. They perhaps even drive a car and have a job. Uh, people that are well on the way to becoming able to enter into contracts. But we're going to say generally that they can't. And so we'll talk more about that. Then we have the situation of somebody who is expecting a baby. You can see this person is pregnant, looks fairly young. Does having a baby, does that make someone able to enter into contracts? We'll see. Getting married, does that make someone able to enter into contracts if they are not otherwise able? Or perhaps just the action of getting engaged, is that sufficient? We'll talk about that. And then finally, joining the armed forces. Um, does that uh, confer uh, contractual capacity upon somebody? Those are some issues that we will grapple with in this chapter. But let's first of all decide what we mean by minors. And let me just pause here and I'm going to write the word minority on here. Commonly when people in everyday English see the word minority, they think of ethnic or racial minorities, a, a group of individuals who make up less than 50% of a particular population. And of course, in many cases, an ethnic or religious or racial minority might be disadvantaged in the society uh, simply because that they don't have a majority stake in the society. Um, while that's obviously an important topic and it's a topic that has lots of legal implications, of course, uh, we're not using the term in that way. So when I use the term minority in this chapter and really throughout contract law, I'm not referring to ethnic or religious or racial minorities. <coughs> I'm talking about an individual who is in his minority. And that is somebody who has not attained his or her majority. In other words, they are under the age of 18. So everybody is in their minority. They may not be a minority. They might be uh, the typical religion in the society, the typical race, the typical ethnicity in the society. But until they've had their 18th birthday, they aren't a minority, but they are in their minority. Um, so this is somebody who has not obtained their majority. And we retain our majority on our 18th birthday in Texas. First thing to keep in mind is that minors don't have any inherent capacity to contract. Imagine for a second that we uh, know of a, a pair of twins. They're both 17 and almost 18, just days away from their 18th birthday. We'll call them Bob and Brad. Bob is very sophisticated. He's had several jobs. He's taken several courses in high school, maybe even dual credit courses, where he's developed a sophisticated understanding of the economy, some economics courses, some accounting courses, maybe some personal finance courses. He's very sophisticated. In fact, he knows more about business than the average adult knows. He's also very bright. He's got a high IQ, high achieving type person, and he's very entrepreneurial. He started several businesses on his own. He's made a significant amount of money. He also day trades in his spare time, and he reads the Wall Street Journal cover to cover every day. So he's about as sophisticated a person as you can imagine, and yet he is under the age of 18, and our legal system says Bob doesn't have any inherent ability to contract. Now we might say, going back to our previous slide, we might say, oops, here we go. Um, we might say, uh, where is that slide? Ah, here we go. We might say that he has the ability to enter into contracts, maybe more ability than the average 30-year-old. But the problem isn't his inherent ability, it's his legal ability. So to have a legal ability, you have to have an ability that the law recognizes. And the law would say about Bob, Bob's under 18, that's all I need to know. That's all the law cares about. Have you had your 18th birthday? Well, then you don't have legal capacity. We don't care how smart you are. We don't care how much life experience you have. We don't care how wise and, and, and possessive of good judgment you might be. We have an on-off switch. Um, it's not a dimmer switch. It, there's not various degrees of readiness. On, at at 12.01 on uh, Bob's 18th birthday, his contractual capacity will descend upon him, but not a moment before then. Let's consider Bob's twin Brad. I mean, they look identical. They have the same mom and dad. They were born the same time um, within a few minutes of each other. So very, very similar. And yet they've had very different paths in life. Uh, Brad is an interest in business. He hasn't uh, chosen to seek employment. He doesn't 
read the Wall Street Journal at all. And his interest might be athletics or maybe the arts or some other discipline. So he's not interested in business. He hasn't taken any business courses or anything along those lines. He's a relatively unsophisticated person in terms of making business decisions or entering into contracts. He would be the example of how maybe the legal system would view the, the average 17 year old. And yet, despite his lack of sophistication, he will attain his contractual capacity at the same moment that Bob obtains it at 12.01 a.m. on the morning of his 18th birthday. And so the law doesn't do um, an individualized analysis. Remember we said this is an objective standard. So we're, the law isn't going to look at Bob and say, well, gosh, Bob's so sophisticated. We're going to give him his ability to contract before Brad's ability. No, we have an objective standard. It's all based upon the birth date. If somehow or another Bob was born uh, first at 1158 p.m. one night and Brad was born at 12.03 a.m. the next um, day and so they actually have different birthdays then they wouldn't for example get contractual capacity at the same time there would be different dates because of different birth dates um, so it's all about when you are born and that's how you get contractual capacity we call this a bright line test but there are other tests that you can imagine. I have heard, I have not independently confirmed this, but I have heard in Great Britain, they do have more of that dimmer switch approach to this area of the law. For example, they consider a particular child's life experience. And so they might look upon someone like Brad and say, you know what, even though Brad is not yet 18, we think he has the judgment and maturity to enter into contracts. And so we are going to enforce the contracts into which he enters. But Brad, Brad's a different story. We don't think he has the sophistication to make wise choices in this area. So we aren't going to enforce his contracts. So they use a subjective standard where they consider the strengths and weaknesses and life experience of the youths before making a decision. Now I'm sure, even if I'm correct about the way that the British system works, I'm sure that there is a date in which everyone on the other side is going to be treated as an adult whose contractual capacity is probably just the people who are very close to their, I don't know if they use 18 or 21, but whatever the, the threshold they use, that's what we're going to be looking towards. So you can imagine a system that could work just very well that is not the bright line test that we have. And there would be advantages and disadvantages to both systems. Of course, an advantage is that it um, is going to probably more appropriately put people into the right categories. Uh, Bob probably should have the right to contra contract because of his high level of sophistication. It's kind of a shame that we're denying him that ability. So that's an advantage to this subjective individualized approach. But there's a pretty significant disadvantage to that system too, and that is nobody's quite sure what bucket they're in, right? I mean, I gave extremes with Bob and Brad, but probably most kids fall in somewhere between those extremes. So let's imagine that it's not just Bob and Brad, but it's actually triplets, identical triplets. We also have Billy, and he is the third child, the third boy in this triplet arrangement. And Billy is neither the business guru that Bob is, nor the business avoider like uh, Brad is. Billy's had a couple jobs and he's taken, you know, some courses that uh, have told him a little bit about business, but that's not his passion. That's not what he's mainly focused on. So he has some information, but not a ton of information. Well, we might be able to tell in the British system that Bob would definitely be considered an adult and Brad would definitely not be considered an adult, but where would we put Bi uh, Bill, Billy in? It would be unclear. Well, one of the things that we work so hard, at least in the American version of contract law, to, to think about is we want there to be a definite answer. In many respects, we don't really care what the answer is. We just want to know what the answer is. Because if we don't like the answer, we can usually uh, work around that. There's lots of different ways we can fix the answer. But when we're not sure of the answer, that's the worst situation. Uncertainty in the law, especially when we're talking about business law, 
costs money, causes delay, is not a good thing. So we want to manage that, reduce that as much as possible. So in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but in my opinion, the bright line test is probably, generally speaking, the better way to go. But whether it's the better way or not the better way, it's certainly the way that we as a culture have, have decided to go. And I don't see any indications that we're rethinking that. So we definitely have this bright line test in uh, the United States and definitely in Texas. Bill, Bob, and Brad would all be treated the same way. Let's see, talk about the term avo avoid avoidable, not avoidable, I'm sorry, voidable. Um, I've gone through this example before, but let me just talk about it again. Uh, you can group contracts into kind of three different categories. We have what we call valid contracts. These are the garden variety ordinary contracts that don't really have any problems. This is what we want. This is the happy ever after of contract law. And this is mainly what we do get. Um, and this one, people just are supposed to do what they're supposed to do. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then they breach the contract and there's going to be consequences for that. So this is your default setting, your expected outcome. But we have two other categories that we want to consider when we talk about contracts. And one is going to be a voidable contract. They all start with V, which is pretty awesome in my opinion. So I'm going to write voidable contracts. And then we have a final category, which is a void contract. I'm going to put contract in quotes because it's really not a contract. We'll see that in a second. Well, let's talk about a voidable contract. Voidable means able to be voided. But as you can hear in the term, if you're able to void something, it also sounds like you're probably able to enforce it as well. You kind of have a choice. You can do A or you can do B. Options are available. And if you have a valid contract, you're stuck with it. I mean, there's no way to get out of it unless you persuade the other side that they don't want to continue in this contract. But if the other side wants to enforce it, you're stuck. You need to do what you're supposed to, to do or you're going to face some pretty negative repercussions. But an avoidable contract, you've got choices. You can treat it as a valid contract and it's going to become a valid contract. Or you can say, uh-uh change my mind, don't want to participate in this, and the contract goes away. It's, um, in a way, the, the, the best of both worlds. You, you have a contract if you want it. You don't have a contract if you don't want it. You are able to void the contract, but you don't have to. The final category, and the reason why I put it in quotes here, is it really isn't a contract at all. We call it a void contract, uh, but that suggests that it's a, a contract that is of the variety of void. But in fact, it's no contract at all. A void contract can't be a contract. Um, basically, the word void here means not a contract. So it's something that is not a contract. In some cases, there may be some kind of enforceable rights associated with it, but we really wouldn't lo look to a traditional contract law to figure out what those rights are. So it's uh, when no matter how much you want to enforce the contract, even if both parties want to enforce the contract and would love for it to be a valid contract, there's just no way to get from here to there. It's a, not going to happen. I like to draw an analogy um, to these types of contracts to family law. Um, I'm not a family law practitioner, so my knowledge of this area is not very deep. But um, So if I get some of the, the specifics incorrect, I apologize. But what I'm trying to do is kind of convey that the layperson's understanding of this. So a valid contract would be a contract in which we'll say Bob marries Mabel. Uh, Bob and Mabel are uh, from two different cities. They've met each other. They've fallen in love. They've decided to marry. We'll say neither one of them have been married before. They're both uh, in their mid-20s. There's just no confusion or complication with their relationship. We call that a valid marriage. Uh, they followed all the rules, they got their marriage license, they told the truth on the marriage license, they, they, they did what they were supposed to, and now they're definitely married. If two or three years into the marriage, Mabel decides she wants a divorce, or she wants, not, wants to not be with Bob, she's going to have to divorce him. I mean, she has that option, uh, but basically what she's saying is, you know, I'm going to breach the contract. I'm going to get out of this contract. She's not going to be able to argue, wait a second, I was never in a contract. 
No, she's stuck with the fact that she is in this contract and now she wants out of the contract. She wants to breach it. Let's consider a different scenario though. This time there's some little wrinkle with Bob and Mabel. I mean, they're, they're still both, um, we'll say they're still both in their 20s, but this time Bob and Mabel are first cousins. I know ick, right? Okay, but you just get beyond that for a second, work with me. Um, in Texas, first cousins can no longer marry each other. If they were married when first cousin marriages were legal, then they can still be married, but um, they are, uh, one of the questions on the marriage license prohibits uh, first cousins. And again, first cousins are cousins who share one set of grandparents. But let's say that Bob and Mabel lie on their marriage license and they say, no, no, we're not first cousins, and they go ahead and get married. And then shortly thereafter, Bob decides, oh, I'm not sure Mabel's the gal for me. I'm not sure I want to be married to her. Well, guess what? That's avoidable marriage. He can get out of it. Now, he can't get out of it 20 years into the marriage. He's going to have to get a divorce. But if it's relatively shortly after he marries, he can change his mind. And instead of getting a divorce, he can get an annulment. And an annulment says, oh, marriage never really happened. I mean, yeah, there was a ceremony. Yeah, there was a minister or a rabbi or a priest or a judge or some official doing it. And paperwork was signed. It looked like it was a marriage, but it really wasn't a marriage. And now either Bob or Mabel can say, I'm out of here. And they haven't breached a contract because in some sense, there never was a contract. So that would be an example of avoidable marriage. I'm assuming me, avoidable contract. That's kind of like an annullable marriage. The final category, again, is this non-category, this non-contract situation. And this would be, no, wait here. This is kind of gross. I apologize. But imagine that Bob and Mabel are brother and sister. I know, appalling, right? They've gotten married. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe one was adopted. Anyway, whatever the scenario is. I mean, they figure out, oh my gosh, we're brother and sister. Um, they don't have to get a divorce. They don't even have to get an annulment. I mean, they'd probably do something because there's a record somewhere of this, but you know what the law would say is, ick, you never really were married. There's nothing you can do to fix this. There's no thing you can sign. There's no agreement you can reach. You just cannot ever, 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 ever enter into a, mar a marriage with your um, sibling. And so therefore, uh, you were never married, even if you thought you were married, and you can't somehow make it a marriage. It's void. Another scenario could be, let's say that Mabel was already married at the time she married Bob. Well, that second marriage to Bob, even if Bob had no idea, even if Mabel had no idea, she was she thought for sure the guy had already died. Uh, but you know what? He hadn't died. Well, guess what? That marriage that Mabel has with Bob really was never a marriage. Even though they both thought it was a valid marriage, it wasn't because Mabel can only have one husband at a time. So this kind of gives you some examples of the different weight of these concepts. And so the one that we're going to focus on most of this particular chapter is going to be this voidable category of marriage. Most of our marriage, or not marriage, sorry, most of our contracts, ah, most of our contracts that we're going to be talking about where there's an issue about contractual capacity, that agreement, if it actually happens, is going to be a voidable contract and not a void contract. So imagine Bob, our savvy business lad, our 17-year-old, enters into a contract and he changes his mind. It ends up not being the best deal for him. Well, he can exit that contract. It's not a valid contract because he lacked legal capacity. It would be a voidable contract. Well, who can void it? Bob can void it. The adult with whom he entered into a contract can't void it because the adult already had contractual capacity. The idea here is that we want to protect those of tender age, those uh, youngsters who might have entered into a, a, a contract that wasn't in their best interest. Now they've gotten the advice of maybe a family member or a friend, or perhaps they have wisened up themselves and recognized that this was a bad decision for them, and they want take backs. And the law says, yep, kid, you get a take back. Your contract is valid if you want it to be, but it's void if you want to void it. Now it's not inherently void. void. Uh, the, the youth can uh, once he becomes an adult, say, yep, that contract's good for me. I want to continue in the contract. And then the contract becomes a valid contract. So um, it's in this middle category, kind of like the annullable marriage. Okay, so contracts for minors are voidable 
at the minor's option before majority and a reasonable time afterwards. So let's say that Bob enters into a contract at 16. At 17, he's figured out, hey, you know what? This isn't the best for me. He can get out. Even after his 18th birthday, he can get out. Now, he can't wait months or years, but he can probably get out of that contract within a few days, maybe even a few weeks, depending upon the, the subject matter of the contract. He's got some time. Again, the law says a reasonable amount of time, and this is going to be an objective standard based upon uh, the circumstances. So let's say he does want to get out of the contract. What do we call that? We call that disaffirmance. Okay, and you can see in our term, we have disaffirmance. Of course, the verb here is going to be to disaffirm. And you can see that we have a base word of affirm here. Well, affirm means to acknowledge or agree to something, to uh, say, yes, I'm going to continue doing X or Y or Z. So if we add the word dis in front of it, we're saying I'm not going to continue doing that. And if we add ants at the end, we're making it a noun. So the definition of disaffirmance is the refusal to fulfill a voidable contract, disavowal, renunciation. So that is Bob's option, or Brad or Bill's option for that matter. They can disaffirm the contract after they've entered into it, and the adult is stuck with that. So let's say that Bob, um, the, the savvy business lad, wants to enter into a contract. Well, as you can imagine, most adults especially adults who are legally savvy, are going to be hesitant to enter into a contract with him because, after all, they know he can disaffirm. And so, you know, if the contract starts going really, really well for the other guy, then maybe Bob will say, eh, it's not working so well for me. And so it's kind of a, an unfair advantage that Bob has in the contract. So you can see how that adult might say, well, Bob, I want to enter into a contract with you. I think it would be good for both of us, but this whole disaffirmance possibility kind of weirds me out. I don't want to participate under those terms. Well, there's a solution. It's a very common solution. That is to have an adult also sign the contract with Bob. And of course, that adult will continue to be bound even if Bob can disaffirm. And we call this co-signing contract. We're going to talk about co-signing contracts later on in the course. But what that basically means is the adult is as bound by the terms of the contract as Bob is, even if the adult isn't getting any goodies out of the contract. Perhaps this is Bob's parent or something along those lines. Let's say Bob wants to buy a car. Bob has got a steady job, but the car, car place isn't prepared to loan him money unless an adult signs. The adult does sign. Even if Bob changes his mind and disaffirms, the adult's still going to be on the hook for the money. That's what co-signing is involved with. We have the definition of, of guardian here. Again, our textbook loves to stick in kind of tangentially involved or tangentially related terms, but I think this one's kind of smart to put it here. So. so what do we have for guardian? A person empowered by the law to act for another who, by virtue of mental capacity, and I added, or youth. So this is the new stuff. You won't find this part in the definition is legally unable to care for himself or herself. And again, the key word here is legally. Bob could take care of himself, no worries. He could get a job, he could pay his rent, he could buy his groceries, he could do all that stuff. He's a savvy, smart person. It's that the law isn't going to let him do that. Let's go to our next slide. Okay, so I just said that Bob can do all these lovely things for himself, um, but I said the law doesn't let him. Well, that's not completely true. I kind of exaggerated a little bit there because I didn't consider the topic of necessaries. A necessary is kind of the old-fashioned legal term for what we would call most commonly as a necessity. I mean, we know what necessities are. Things reasonably necessary for maintaining a person in accordance with his or her position in life. Um, food, clothing, medical care, medications, doctor's visits, all of those things we would consider necessities. If you don't have food, you're not going to live too long. If you're sick and you don't get to the doctor, you might die. If you don't have clothes, well, you're going to get sunburned and be in bad shape and probably going to be arrested and locked up as a crazy person. So there's lots of problems if you don't have these basic needs met. Um, and sometimes what happens, unfortunately, is that 
sometimes youths are estranged from their parents or from the people that are supposed to provide care for them. And in those situations, that estranged child still needs food and shelter and those types of things. The need doesn't go away simply because they aren't getting it from their ordinary source, their parents. Um, and so we still need to get Bob, let's say Bob has run away from home. We still need to get Bob fed and clothed, despite the fact that he isn't living under his parents' roof. Um, but we, he can't enter into context. We've already decided that, right? So we're going to have to come up with an alternative way of looking at this, because we know if we're missing one of the elements of contracts, in this case, capacity, we don't have a contract. I mean, we just don't have a contract. There's no fix with that. Whatever we're going to be able to do for Bob isn't going to be a contract. And in fact, we have a fancy dancy name for that, and that is quasi-contract. And again, we've seen quasi before, but let me just do a little bit of a reminder. I kind of think of it as kind of, sort of, but not quite a contract. You can see it's kind of inspired by contract law. It's the fix. It's kind of the equitable solution that the courts came up with when something that, you know, kind of quacked like a duck or quacked like a contract but wasn't quite a contract uh, happened, the fact pattern. And the courts are struggling. Well, you know, we feel like we ought to do something here, but it isn't a contract, so we can't do that. So what are we going to do? And then they came up with this uh, quasi-contract theory. Okay, so in this situation, um, if the child has not been emancipated, and we'll talk about that in a bit, so we're talking about unemancipated children here. Well, guess what? Uh, parents still have the obligation to provide for the necessities of their children, even if the child is estranged from the parent. That duty continues unless the child is emancipated in some way, or the parent um, has in some sense surrendered his parental rights and obligations. So, um, Bob still needs to eat. He still needs a roof over his head. And so the parent is responsible for uh, providing those things. So if Bob enters into a contract, maybe for an apartment or buys some food for himself or secures medical treatment, um, he has to pay for it or the parent has to pay for it. But we don't say it's a contract. We say it's a quasi-contract because um, if we said to Bob, or if, let's say we said generally in the world, well, you know what? If Bob enters into a contract for an apartment, he doesn't have to honor it. How many places are going to rent Bob uh, uh, an apartment? Not many. And yet Bob needs a roof over his head. So the rule that was designed to protect Bob from foolish Decision-making actually puts Bob in a worse position because he needs a roof over his head. Similarly, when Bob goes to the store to buy clothes, if he can disavow or disaffirm that contract, is that store going to be willing to sell him clothes? Probably not. So under those circumstances, um, Bob is not going to be able to buy any clothes. And so we want Bob to have clothes. Uh, and so uh, we say, you know what? We're going to apply this quasi-contract theory. We're not going to treat the agreement that Bob makes with these stores or these landlords as contracts, but we're going to say we're going to treat them kind of like contracts. And so what we're going to require that the, the minor or the minor's parents do is pay the reasonable value for those particular items that are necessaries. Now, would this apply to a lobster at the fanciest restaurant in town? Probably not. Would it apply to a, you know, $2,000 wedding dress or a tuxedo from the, from the best tailor in town? No, probably wouldn't. Would this apply to the penthouse apartment um, suite at, you know, the, hot, the most expensive luxury apartment complex in town? No, it wouldn't. Um, so we're not talking about everything that might qualify as shelter or food. We're talking about things that meet that basic need. And we're going to talk about the reasonable value. Let me give you an example. Um, so I'm, now I'm Bob. I'm a 17-year-old. I'm shopping for, actually I'm Brad. I'm shopping for a loaf of bread. I'm hungry. I'm estranged from my parents. I don't know a lot about the business world. I've never bought a loaf of bread before. I really don't have any notion about how expensive it is. I wander into Whole Foods and I see this loaf of bread there and they're charging 10 bucks. Okay, I mean, 
That must be what bread costs, 10 bucks a loaf. Okay, so that's what I need, that's what I'm gonna buy. So I go to the checkout counter and I put $10 down and I am given the loaf of bread, I go out to the car. Maybe I'm on the phone with a friend and I say, yeah, I just bought a loaf of bread for 10 bucks. The friend goes, what? You pay 10 bucks for a loaf of bread, you idiot? That's way too much money. Go change that loaf of bread. You can get one at Kroger or Walmart for a fraction of that cost. So um, uh, Brad uh, goes over to Kroger, buys a loaf of bread for a fraction of the cost, and then goes back to Whole Foods and says, I want to return this loaf of bread. Whole Foods, maybe they have a policy that they don't um, handle refunds. But once Brad says, I'm a minor, then, uh, assuming that the Whole Foods uh, management staff is familiar with quasi-contract theory, which they may not be. They're going to realize that, that Bob is only going to be responsible, me, Brad is only going to be responsible for the reasonable value of the necessary items. In that situation, probably the reasonable value is the typical price of a loaf of bread. Well, let's say most grocery stores in the Collin County area, a loaf of bread is $2. And so the court would probably say, you know what? Whole Foods, you can only charge Brad $2 per loaf. Not the price that was actually marked, not the price that Brad originally paid, but the typical, the reasonably expected value for that particular loaf of bread, unless you can prove that there's something unusual about that bread. Perhaps, you know, it's got, you know, lobster butter in it or something. I don't know, something exciting that might make it more expensive. So does in this analysis, the ability to pay can be a factor. So if Bob or Bill, actually, we'll go back with Brad. Brad is still looking for that job. He's still, uh, you know, he's living off of his savings. He used to have a paper route maybe, and he doesn't have a lot of money left. Well, maybe Bob, Bill, sorry, Brad can't afford the $2. So the court might say, well, maybe $2 is a little bit rich for Brad right now. And so we're going to only make him pay a dollar for that loaf of bread. There is definitely a sliding skill to this analysis because we do consider things like the economic ability of the child. Think about Brad who has his day trading account and quite a bit of savings from all the businesses that he ran. Well, the court's going to be much more willing to put a bigger bill associated with all of these services on Bob than it is on Brad. You might also consider the social status. Let's say Bob and Brad's uh, mom is a doctor, her uh, hu the dad is a, a high-priced business person. Um, they have they came from a wealthy family with lots of economic. Um, advantages. Well, the court might find that maybe the occasional lobster meal is a necessary in that situation. And so there definitely is a totality of the circumstances. Also, a child's needs can vary. If you had a special needs child, for example, who might need more medical care or um, a special diet or things along those lines, then the court would certainly look at those issues as well when it decides what qualifies as a necessary. We see here an example, we'll call her Brenda. Little Brenda here is shopping in the store. Uh, since she's in the cart, I'm assuming she's with mom or dad, but maybe she's not. You can see she has some seedless green grapes here, right by her right arm. And she's got some Nilla wafers and some watermelon. So she's making some pretty good healthy choices here. Um, if she were shopping by herself, we would say that she is shopping for necessaries. Okay, so let's consider the situation where we have baby John Doe, and he's got his fake ID. He's ready to um, uh, do some some naughtiness, I guess, <laughs> um, as a as as a potentially twenty eighteen or twenty one year old. Um, obviously, one of the things that we've all heard about, I'm sure none of us ever did this, but we've all heard about people misrepresenting their age, especially minors who want to appear to be older because of some legal impediment. Oftentimes, it's the drinking age or the smoking age, but it could be the ability to enter into contracts. So what happens when the minor misrepresents his or her age, either with a fake ID or just tell somebody the wrong age? Um, how does that impact things? Well, the, the textbook says 
that typically the answer that the courts will come up with is that both parties can disaffirm the contract. Um, and, and that could be the result in many states. Um, the answer in Texas is not a 100% situation, but there's been some indications in case law that we would go um, a bit of a different route. Very likely we would say that if the minor represents him or herself or herself as an adult, that minor is stuck with that determination. And so he will be treated as an adult, assuming that the adult believed those representations. And obviously if it's a 10 year old kid who says, hey, I'm 18, well, the adult isn't, shouldn't believe that. I mean, that wouldn't be reasonable under the circumstances. But if it's reasonable, if the adult with whom the minor contracted reasonably believed that the minor was, in fact, 18, and the minor represented himself, very likely the court would say, it's a valid contract. It's not a voidable contract. At least there are some reasons to believe that would be the finding in Texas. Now, let's talk about the policy issues that might drive a court in a different jurisdiction to take a different stance. A court in another jurisdiction might say, look, the reason why we don't enforce minors' contracts is they're silly. They make bad choices. It's because they're kids. And what's more kid-like, what's more silly and immature than lying about your age? And so the fact that they are doing what they're doing tells us they're not ready to enter into contracts. And so therefore, we shouldn't enforce the contract. Anyway, that's the argument for it. Um, now, they extend it to adults because it doesn't seem fair that the adult who thinks he was entering into a contract with another adult is now in this vulnerable position, whereas he, whereas he is bound by the contract, but this kid who lied to him isn't. And so the court's kind of trying to evil the playing field will say, well, you know what, once the adult finds out about the minor's deception, the adult also has the ability to disaffirm the contract. Um, and so that's the idea. And we have the idea that we want to avoid unjust enrichment because you can see how the ability to disaffirm a contract can really be strategically very valuable for the minor. Um, you know, whenever you enter into a contract, things can go lots of different ways. Maybe you'll make money, maybe you won't. Well, if you're a, a minor who lies about his age and persuades an adult to enter into, mul say, multiple contracts with you, well, you get to cancel all the ones that don't work out to your advantage and continue the ones that do. And that adult, if he didn't have the ability to disaffirm, would be stuck with that result. And so you can see how that would be a situation of an unjust enrichment. You could even see how somebody like Bob might actually plan for that and use his minority status as a, a tool to... Um, actually engage in unjust enrichment. So we've talked about disaffirmance, but we haven't talked about the opposite. We haven't talked about the more common path, which is typically the minor will say, yeah, I'm an adult now. I think this contract is good for me, so I'm going to keep it. My guess is that um, when before your 18th birthday, you entered into lots of contracts. You probably bought some groceries, some gas at the gas station. You perhaps went to the CVS and bought some things and entered into all kinds of contracts with various businesses. My guess is that you did not keep all those receipts and that you did not present those receipts to the various businesses shortly after your 18th birthday and go to them each and say, you know what, three years ago I bought some gas here. just want to let you know I'm okay with that. I'm going to make my peace with that. Um, I'm not going to return the gas to you now and I'm not going to ask for a refund. If you were to do that, I promise you that gas station manager would look at you like, what the heck are you talking about? What do you mean? Of course you're not returning the gas. That's silly. Um, and he's right to think that way. But um, it's not necessary for you to actually go and verbally or expressly ratify. I mean, it's fine if you do. We have the option of express ratification, which can be orally or in written form, but more likely it's going to be the implied ratification. You don't go to that gas station. You don't say, you know what, I'm right here to ratify. I bought gas here about 17 times while I was a minor. I'm now an adult. Just wanted to let y'all know I'm expressly ratifying those transactions. No, you're not doing that. And by not going there to disaffirm them, you are essentially ratifying them. You're continuing to use the gas, or if the gas is already gone, you aren't saying, hey, you know what, I want to look into this in more details.
So a ratification moves a contract from voidable to valid. There's no way out now. You're stuck with it, and so is the other side. So ratification, you can see here we have the word ratify at the beginning, and we have this suffix that makes it into a noun. So it's the approval of a previous act actions or conduct indicating a person's express promise to be bound by a contract. So now there's no take backs. We are committed. Okay, so we looked at the beginning and talked about some pictures here about some various scenarios and trying to figure out what's going to happen in a minor's life when when his or her circumstances start seeming more and more adult-like. So let's now reflect upon what those options might look like. Okay, so um, you've probably heard the term emancipation of minors. Um, we, we use the term emancipation in a couple of different ways in English. Generally, the term means to free. Um, somebody. Um, historically, of course, Emancipation of Slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln and during the Civil War. Uh, so emancipation in that context had to do with freeing people from bondage. Um, emancipated minors is a little bit different. We're freeing people from the disability of their minority status. They are gaining their majority. They are free in that sense. Um, so again, we're not focusing upon the historic um, facts of the Emancipation Proclamation. We're now again still focusing upon people who are under the age of 18. So emancipated minors are minors, and when I say minors, I really mean people under 18, who live separately from their parents and are held to adult standards. So emancipation is kind of a two-edged sword. I mean, in one sense, you get to be free of the disabilities of your minority status. But on the other hand, suddenly all of the obligations that adults have come descending upon you. And now you can't go to your parents and say, hey, you've got to fix this for me. Parents don't have to. I mean, they might, but they have no legal obligation to do so. As far as the law is concerned, you are a full-blown adult. So another term for emancipation is the removal of disabilities. It's another term that's a little bit confusing because typically in English nowadays when we use, see the term disabilities, we think about somebody who has a difference. Uh, they might be in a wheelchair. They might have a vision or hearing problem. They might have a learning difference. So we're talking about that they are less able to do a particular task. Um, but here this is a legal disability. So we're talking about minors who lack the ability to enter into contracts. And when we remove it, we aren't, you know, giving them the ability to walk or to see or something like that, but we're removing the legal limitations that we had on them. So it's a removal of legal disabilities, not physical or mental or emotional disabilities. So how do we get this type of emancipation if we're under the age of 18? Well, we're going to have to go to court to do it. Sometimes it's the minor who files a petition for emancipation. Sometimes it's the parents who do it. It can happen either way. Um, another thing that can happen in Texas, and this is going to vary from state law, from state to state, is that a minor can emancipate because of some action that he or she does that is not this judicial declaration. One is marriage. So if I marry at 16 or 17, and by the way, it's much more difficult to do that now in Texas than it once was, but if I were to marry at 16 or 17, I um, am automatically emancipated at that point. Um, all the disabilities are removed. My parents have no continuing obligation to take care of me. Also, if I join the armed services, I'm considered an adult at that time. Obviously, I need the permission of a parent um, or the court to go ahead and do so, but if I obtain that permission, then I'm going to be um, emancipated fully an adult at that time. One thing that doesn't emancipate me is pregnancy and even parenthood. So if I am a, a teenage, we'll say I'm a teenage girl who has given birth to a child, um, I am not emancipated by having given birth. If I am the teenage father, I am not emancipated by my girlfriend having given birth. Um, but even though I am not emancipated, 
um, and I am still under 18, I am legally responsible for that child, whether I am the mom or the dad. My parents are still legally responsible for me. They aren't responsible for their grandchild, but so they're responsible for me and I'm legally responsible for my child. Um, that's a difference there. So, so pregnancy doesn't, of course, if we get married, perhaps because of the pregnancy, that would be a different scenario. And then that marriage emancipates, not the pregnancy. Okay, so that's our conclusion of that first topic. Let me just go ahead and check that off. So we have exhausted this topic and you'll see that we've actually kind of covered some concepts that we'll see going again and again. So the, our next topics will be a little bit quicker. So let's go on to our second topic for this lecture, which is insanity. Actually, let's just, let's just go here and look at this picture. So this is no for capacity. This is yes. We have the wedding ring, not the engagement, but the wedding ring. And this is yes. So we're up here to the issue of insane and mentally ill persons. One of the challenges with insanity and mental illness in the legal capacity context is that we don't have that on off switch we can rely upon when we're talking about minority. Assuming that somebody knows the day that they were born, they can easily calculate when they gain their legal majority. But by definition, insanity is not related to age, it's related to a mental condition. And um, very various illnesses and injuries can cause insanity and mental illness. And the, the degree of mental illness is going to vary depending upon uh, treatment, uh, that partic per person's particular biology, maybe the progression of the illness, um, lots of different factors can play a role in that. And so the fact that somebody was diagnosed with X disease or Y disease does not automatically make them lose their legal capacity. And so it's, it really does require a very specific individualized analysis. So um, while the standard is objective in some sense, it's also very individualized. Okay, so let's talk about the category of people who are insane and when they can enter into contracts. Imagine that I have a type of insanity that is treatable, at least to some extent, with medication. When I'm on my medication, I still have a mental illness, obviously, but I am able to negotiate the world. I'm able to understand what reality is and what reality isn't. Perhaps I'm no longer hallucinating or imagining things that are not so, or at least um, I have a more a deeper grasp of, of what's real and what's not real. Um, and when I stay on that medication, I may have lucid periods of time. During those times, I can enter into contracts and those contracts are gonna be binding upon me. And maybe those moments are brief, maybe a few hours or a few days. And then those moments, if I stay on my medication, could last for weeks or months or years. Um, but they may not last forever. Perhaps the medication stops working as effectively or perhaps I stop taking it. Um, and so maybe I return to a condition in which I am not able to make sense of my world where I'm hallucinating or confused or paranoid or something along those lines. So let's say that this person who has periods of lucidity uh, and also periods where they aren't lucid, let's say that they enter into a contract during one of those periods where they lacked lucidness and then they regain their lucidity. Well, in order to be able to disaffirm that contract, they're going to have to prove that they lack legal capacity. I mean, the default setting is going to be that you're, if you're over the age of 18, you have legal capacity. And so if you are entering into a contract that you want to get out of because you feel like you are not lucid, you've got a bit of an uphill battle. I mean, it's not the burden of proof is going to be preponderance of the evidence, but uh, the assumption is going to be, well, 
I mean, you agree to it and you're over 18. So what's your evidence that you're not, you were not lucid at the time? So you can see it's going to be very fact specific. The courts aren't going to be so interested in what was going on inside of my brain. They're going to be more interested in what would a fly on the wall have thought about this? Uh, was my behavior strange? Was I um, acting paranoid, looking around, constantly darting my eyes? Was I pointing or describing things that weren't present? Was my speech incoherent? Uh, did I seem confused, excessively worried? Did I uh, express concerns that didn't make sense? Those types of things would be evidence that might cause the court to conclude that I was not competent at the time that I entered into the contract. Just like minors, incompetent people, even really, really detached from reality people, still need the same things that every other human being needs. Medical treatment, a shelter, clothing, um, those essentials of life, food, and so um, they can enter into contracts for necessaries under that same quasi-contract theory that we talked about when we were talking about minors. In fact, that's true um, for um, insane people as well. Let's talk about, and again, so a, an insane person uh, enters into a voidable contract the same way that we talked about the minor entering into it. So it's a contract that once the insane person regains his or her sanity, he or she can affirm the contract, ratify the contract, and make it valid contract or can disaffirm the contract and make it void. So let's look at what um, are voidable contracts. The party is incompetent or insane at the time of the contracting, and these are just synonyms for the same thing. I would say if the infirmity lessens, oh, I say worsens there, that doesn't make sense. So when, when, again, the party returns to competency, the party has the option of disaffirming. But let's look at this one. This one's a little bit important for us to talk about. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about this category. And that is somebody who has been judicially declared to be incompetent. And the term for it in the law is non, non compos mentis. Obviously, it's a Latin expression, but basically it means not mentally competent. You can even kind of see those words lurking in that Latin expression. So when a person has been declared this way and a guardian is appointed for that person and that person's contract ability to enter into contract has been removed from him or her until at some point in time or it may be restated. Maybe that person regains his or her uh, uh, competency. Uh, sometimes this is done when somebody has dementia or a brain injury that's very severe and has really left this person maybe even not conscious or in a very low state of awareness. Um, even sometimes very severe mental illness can cause somebody to be held non compos mentis. If the person improves, of course, this disability can be removed, unfortunately. It was probably not very common that that actually happens. And this is a fairly common thing to happen with very elderly people who are experiencing senility or dementia. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of treatments nowadays for those conditions, and so probably the person is not going to regain their competency. So when person has been declared incompetent in a court of law, there's going to be a, a legal notice that is published uh, typically in a newspaper that's going to say, hey, don't enter into contracts with Bob because he is non compos mentis. Um, my guess is that you don't pour over those sections of the newspaper every morning. Um, and let, let's imagine, though, that you happen to work at the CVS across the street from the assisted living community. Um, We've aged Bob. He's no longer 17. He's now 97. He's had a good, good long run, lots of happy times, but he's near the end of his life, and he unfortunately has some pretty significant dementia. Um, his parent, I mean, excuse me, his grandkids or maybe his kids still take care of him, and they have had him uh, ruled non compos mentis, and so he uh, can't enter into contracts on his own behalf. 
But you know what? He has days where he's a little bit more lucid than other days, and this happens to be one of them. And he has managed to escape from his assisted living community. He comes to your store, your CVS, which is next door to the assisted living community, and he comes in, he picks up a pack of gum, he puts some cash on the counter, and uh, you ring that cell, you give him his change back, he puts it in his pocket, he takes the gum, he walks out. You had no way of knowing that Bob was not fully competent. Uh, honestly, it was kind of a non-event, the whole transaction, you didn't think much about it at all. And yet, what the law would say is, you should have remembered that this guy, Bob, was declared non compos mentis. When you were reading the newspaper, you should have noticed that. Now, you might say, but gosh, even if I had read the paper, I would have had a picture of Bob in the paper. And so how would I have been able to connect Bob from the newspaper to this man who walked into my store? I mean, he paid cash. I didn't have to get any ID from him. It wasn't like he was buying liquor or cigarettes. <laughs> And frankly, even if he was, he was clearly over the age of 21. Um, so you might say that this rule about non compos mentis is a little bit silly. It is. Um, in many cases, the, the, uh, the a person who has kind of escapes from their caregivers are going to be entering into contracts. But, you know, who cares about a contract for a, a pack of bubble gum? It's only when you're buying bigger items that it becomes important that you be able to get out of those contracts. Uh, but the general rule is that once you're declared judicially um, incompetent, your contracts aren't void. They are, excuse me, they're not voidable. They are void. There's nothing that Bob can do to make that contract voidable as long as he is judicially declared to be incompetent. Obviously, if he recovers to some extent and gets that designation lifted, then he can enter into contracts. So how does this bar work? Is it a very high bar? Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about void contracts since I already kind of touched on the subject. Again, void contracts aren't contracts at all. They're like the marriage between the brother and the sister, the marriage between the person who already had a spouse. Um, so the void contracts are when somebody has been ju ju declared ju a non compos mentis and this person tries to enter into something like a contract. Well, again, it's useless it's void it's nothing only the guardian for that person has the capacity to enter into that type of contract um so we don't really talk too much about this one i'm sorry we would probably should have had more one more slide on this and that is what is the bar like for a uh, capacity of in, the insane it's not very high Lots of people experience mental illness, and the vast majority of those people are perfectly capable to enter into contracts. So if I have depression, even severe depression, I still understand what reality is. I still know who I am. I still know the year and the date. I know how much money I have in the bank. I know there aren't zombies running around ready to eat my brains. Um, I don't hallucinate things. I uh, obviously am ill, but I am not ill to the extent that I lack the ability to enter into contracts. The same is true for most mental illnesses. Typically, we're looking at mental illnesses where the person really doesn't understand who they are or what their financial situation are, is, or they are hallucinating things, really, really severe levels of distress and dysfunction. So the, uh, it's a very low bar to establish that you are competent under this, this standard. Um, the vast, vast majority of people, even people who are uh, doing poorly, are going to still have capacity um, under this standard. So now we have covered our second category. Oops, went too far. We have covered legal sanity as our third requirement for legal capacity. In our next lecture, we will cover our last three topics, sobriety, being a legal resident, and not being a felon. I hope that this presentation has been helpful for you. I appreciate your attendance and, and your participation. Um, please be sure to watch our next video where we cover the other topics. As always, if you have questions, please stop by my office hours or send me a quick email and we'll figure out what we need to do to get you the information that you need. Again, thanks for your attention and have a wonderful day.